So I'm uh, Lance Pritchett. I'm a faculty here at the Kennedy School, and I've been asked to moderate um, this um, very interesting session. Um, all who know me or have seen me in other settings realize I'm not a very good moderator. I'm normally an extremator. <laughs> um, <laughs> try and push people um, away from moderate views towards extreme views. Um, and I think my role, given that we only have about 20 minutes, is to maybe to ask a couple of questions, and then I'm sure all of you and many of you in the audience will have questions of your own. Um, so I think if I could just ask each of the presenters sort of a, a different question. Um, because in this sort of theme of them and us, I think there's <laughs> oftentimes what us is is not them. Um, meaning that's how it's defined. Uh, a famous academic once said, a nation is a group of people who hate their neighbors and misunderstand their history. Um, uh, that's how you define a nation. Um, so uh, let me ask, Three different questions. First, um, on this issue of you know bringing in, there's fundamentally two kinds of mobility, and there's low scale and high scale. And you know we're making a strong case that high scale migration is really necessary to the dynamism of economy because lots of skills and practices are actually tacit and need direct human to human connection. Um, how much of the resistance do you think is uh, awareness and or sentiment that the existing professional associations are controlling rents, meaning preferred access into regulated industries, and are worried that their rents will disappear rather than seeing the expansion of a sector? They're just, you know, say, look, we sort of went to school to be able to be qualified to do this. We don't want to compete against the whole world. We want to compete against the limited people that pass these qualifications. Um, the, the, the second question for Sri Lanka, and I think you did a very good job of articulating that kind of Sri Lanka is an instance in which, you know, the foreigners that you're most nervous about are in fact residents, <laughs> which is different. Um, so in some ways, you know, residents of the island are the primary not us. And that has been a continual conflict. But the question is, are there groups that, you know, separately from dealing with the issue of Tamil and the diaspora, are there groups that the Sri Lankans are more neutral? And, and the second issue, of course, is that Sri Lanka has 22 million people. Sure. Its nearest neighbor has a billion, probably adds 22 million a year to its population. So one can understand being very nervous about India because it's just so huge relative to you. But are there other groups that the Sri Lankans don't see as dangerously not us on which you could make more progress? You know, uh, Europeans, for instance, uh, just open regime for, or Latin Americans. Um, and w is that part of the ongoing discussion? And. I'm going to raise the awkward question in the room, which is, as one of your near neighbors who was very much, you know, Panama was in some sense Colombia, <laughs> and was immigrated into a region. You're in danger. What? You're in danger. I know. <laughs> I preceded all of this by saying I'm not a moderator, and I'm not a politician. Um, but one of your near neighbors, Venezuela, is collapsing, and there's a massive diaspora out of Venezuela, it would seem Venezuela would be us. Like, how does how do how is Panama seeing its role in what is becoming an ongoing, interesting refugee crisis? And in what sense does one define a Panamanian that in which Panamanians are us and Venezuelans are a dangerous other? My turn. You can start. <laughs> maybe the hardest question. And we'll go this direction. I think I think it's a great question because uh, in the recent in recent years, as much as we had Chinese and and Caribbeans earlier over a hundred years ago, we've had Colombians and we've had Venezuelans, and I, I I'll be honest. Right now, they're not us. They're not seen as from Panamanians as us. 
However, I, I was thinking this morning, my youngest son has been in, in school with a Venezuelan who's one of his best friends ever since they were in spirit school. Mm. But he's Venezuelan. And I wonder when will this kid be part of us? That's a big issue. That's a big issue. I think, I am sure that uh, Panama will be able, as we had before, to incorporate into the story of us, Colombians, Venezuelans, and other Latin Americans, migrants that are coming to Panama. But as much as it happened when we built the original canal and was, it was a difficult situation originally and they weren't part of us originally, they will become part of it. How long it will take, I'm not sure. I think from the government part, we have a role to play in order to um, work against the myth of that some people have, not everybody, that foreigners are competition, that foreigners create problems. Because many of us do see that foreigners contribute to, to our country, contribute to our, our economy, and we need to make sure to carry this, this story further. In terms of the humanitarian situation in Venezuela, we have been working with other uh, governments in the region. We are working with some international organizations. It's a very dramatic situation because the, the the most difficult crisis we believe, believe is within Venezuela. And as long as the Venezuelan government does not recognize that there is a humanitarian crisis, you cannot support them in overcoming a crisis that does not exist, according to them. But we do believe, and Panama is taking uh, uh, the lead in that regard, that we need to structure a humanitarian response for the rest of the countries. Because when the elections come, if they do come, and I think they will, uh, 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 in a few weeks from now, that this might explode further. And we might see a larger group of Venezuelans exiting Venezuela and moving to neighboring countries. And what are we going to do in order to support these people that are looking for better days for their family and that we have a responsibility as, as, as neighbors, are, as part of the Latin American community to, to respond in a very difficult, tragic situation. I do think that even though we cannot think in our region, I, I don't think it's a way refugee camps know, but there are ways of articulating a response, find, finding possibilities of working, finding support in establishing in a given country. What are the shared measures that governments can take in order to face what is uh, a, a huge situation? Thanks. Uh, so you ask about whether the professional unions are looking for rents. Um, so the, the interesting thing about the professional unions uh, is that, so as Nirmalan explained, uh, their, their main argument is that uh, we don't want more inflow because we risk to get um, less qualified and a lower quality people uh, into professions that are now uh, you know, of a decent quality. And um, I think the most uh, extreme case for me is the, uh, the IT sector that's uh, very, very small in Sri Lanka and had even recently reacted in the media with kind of the same argument, even like calling out the Indians saying, there will be all these Indians that are lesser quality uh, in our sector. <laughs> Which is sorry, that's a pretty tough case to make. That's Those a Indians, very tough case. They're to make. so awful at this. <laughs> yes, they've had no success at all. Uh, yeah. So, so when uh, when I went to Sri Lanka and I spoke to uh, to students, uh, mm. because because as I show, uh, there there are very few students graduating with a degree in, in IT. Uh, and when you ask this uh, the students, uh, why don't you apply to some of the uh, IT universities in India, and they say it's really, really hard. <laughs> so, so it's really hard to make this argument. Mm. And uh, the worst part of it is even if they think that they're protecting the, the jobs and the wages of mm. the employees, mm. they are absolutely not. And this is why the outflow uh, of professionals uh, from Sri Lanka is so large. So just going to, uh, to um, Saudi Arabia, we saw that a professional, a Sri Lankan employee, uh, a Sri Lankan <coughs> professional in Saudi Arabia earns on average four times the wage that a Sri Lankan professional earns in Sri Lanka. So you cannot tell me that the professional unions are 
making it better for, for the Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka. I think what would make it better is to size up the sector. And when the sector is sizable and powerful, uh, that's when wages go up, because that's when you become uh, internationally uh, competitive. And that's when uh, employment multipliers and wage multipliers kick in for other sectors too. So keeping the sector small through a very protective professionals union is not doing uh, good to, to any of these employees. Um, so the, the, the short answer is, uh, it's very clear that there are countries with whom um, or with which um, we can enter into agreements and there won't be issues. And one good example is Singapore. We just concluded uh, an FTA with Singapore. Mm -hmm. And there certainly wasn't the same level of objections that are there in relation to India. Uh, there is actually a f um, far more fear in relation to India than with regard to China. We are also negotiating with China at the moment. The fear is that the Indian workforce would be able to make inroads into Sri Lanka. Part of it is historical, part of it is uh, political. Uh, part of it is the fact that the Indian workforce would be able to uh, assimilate much better. Mm. Uh, they would be able to speak uh, English uh, far better than their Chinese counterparts. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, perception. So it's the, the fear is with the, with the Indian professionals. Mm. Um, with, with Singapore, we saw we have already concluded it. In fact, there were professional groups which, uh, which, which shows how altruistic they are. They were actually quite concerned about their prospects in Singapore. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they were not very concerned about Singaporeans coming into Sri Lanka. So, um, so it, that's the, 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 the answer is yes. Uh, and we have seen it in practice. And the issue is primarily uh, the India um, phobia. Hmm. Uh, let's open to the room for questions. Uh, I don't know how that's been handled. People just raise their hands. So let me take, why don't we take three different questions? Sort of one, two, three. And then we'll ha ask the, we'll maybe take a second round. Oh, thank you so much. Lupika, I just wanted to mention, you probably know this already, but the issue of pro professional licensing has recently gotten a fair amount of attention, even here in the US. Uh, probably the most notable example is hair braiding, which is an innocuous and safe practice that goes back a thousand years, uh, that uh, in some states, more than half of the 50 states, I believe, you have to get a license to practice which a cosmetological license, which may cost a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, this got the attention of even President Obama before the end of his term, uh, because so many of the folks affected are young black women who make their living or would like to make their living by braiding hair. Um, the uh, Institute for Justice has been the most vocal and visible, I think, about uh, uh, trying to roll back these professional licenses. I, I wanted to throw some uh, statistics at you um, to see if they're incorporated, all of you, at the room, mm. to see if they're incorporated into some of the analysis of the, the benefits of, mm -hmm. of, of migration, of immigration. Mm -hmm. In the United States, in which we get about a million to a million to migrant workers a year, both legal and illegal, the uh, effect that that has on our implied savings rate and what we save by that having that human capital arrive mm -hmm. here, because we need them, they're employed, they're not gonna go unemployed. We, have, we don't have a replacement, a human replacement birth ratio that, that, that is fulfilling the needs of the country. The human capital that we gain from that immigration flow is about a trillion dollars a year. It costs the United States roughly a little bit under a million dollars to raise a citizen from birth to the average educational attainment of its immigrant population, which is roughly high school to a little bit of college. That's the average educational attainment. What that means is that the United States has been able to grow at a much faster pace than the UK, Europe, and Japan with a much lower savings rate. 
Roughly the savings rate in the United States right now is about 6%. With one trillion of implied savings of that human capital that arrives in the country, fully fed, raised, and reasonably educated, it'd be better if it were <laughs> better educated, but it's reasonably educated, we have an implied increase in our savings rate, which is not measured at all in our GDP statistics. <laughs> five percentage points higher than the six percent that we that we reflect. So I am suggesting it will vary from country to country depending on how expensive it is to raise a citizen in, in each country. But I want to throw that at you because I haven't seen in any of the of the immigration uh, policy research that's been shared with us that kind of analysis. This is for the, this is for the first speaker. Uh, just, I'm just wondering, at the same time, I'm convinced that uh, as a politician that uh, migration brings uh, uh, economic benefits. At the same time, just to ask you a question, a clarification, you spoke about India and Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka started actually manufacturing in the, in the 80s. Uh, Mazda and Fiat cars were manufactured, but that uh, entrepreneur was killed. And uh, uh, then, then the civil war struck. Uh, so for India, you spoke about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley came later. Before that, Tata, uh, 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 Bajaj, they started manufacturing a close economy. So we try to support always migration brings. And when it comes to Europe, migration has brought a headache, terrorism also. So whether it's worth it to take a risk in migration, countries such as China, Japan, India, Saudi Arabia, which have a zero tolerance for migration, has less trouble with terrorism and the rest of it. I know Europe is facing a huge problem. People don't like to talk about it. What are you talking uh, about? So is it worth it with the economic benefits uh, that the risk you're taking also with migration, the problems that you're causing for a, for a longer time, uh, which you cannot sometimes uh, solve in the future? What, uh, just to clarify, Saudi Arabia is about half foreigners. Uh, they're, they're not residents. They're, they're not citizens. Okay. Uh, they but, just but have a, yeah. I'm saying they don't have a zero migration policy by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, uh, but China, we don't get citizenship. They don't take the... Okay, yeah, yeah. That's a separate issue than having them resident, which is... Yeah, countries have progress but, without migration. Mm. Uh, okay, but, but again, migration includes changing residence whether you change citizenship or not. Meaning mobility is migration. Yes. And then whether or not a migrant in Saudi Arabia acquires citizenship or not is a separate question to whether they're a migrant. There are tons of migrants in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's one, one instance, Saudi Arabia. But there are so many other countries which they are not tolerant towards migration, but they've done well. Close economies. Why don't people talk about uh, those examples, India, China? They were close economies, and then they, they, uh, they are here where they are at this, at the, at this moment with that uh, economic uh, strategies. OK. Um, any of you care to address any of those questions? I think you need oh, to I address have, one yeah. of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. So, um, so the last one, OK, w w one quick one is about, was about uh, professional licensing in the United States. I didn't know about the hair braiding. Uh, the one case I'm aware of is uh, medical professionals. Um, so there is a very strong uh, American Medical Association of uh, doctors uh, that prevents a lot of the, I believe, the medical practitioners. So you can be uh, a professional nurse nowadays with a PhD, uh, but you cannot do the same job as uh, a lot, you cannot give a lot of the services that doctors do, uh, even though you may have the same level of practice and the same level of education. And this is mainly uh, driven by uh, professional uh, associations uh, at the national and then um, at state levels. And there is research being done showing that at the state level, uh, states that have stronger um, regulation uh, uh, actually have lower uh, uh, lower access to certain kind of health care and because you basically create artificial shortage 
uh, of healthcare by um, you know giving more of the jobs to the doctors and less to the very qualified nurses. Uh, so so that's one case, and it's very distortionary, and uh, uh, I don't think it's being solved. Um, on the on Sujiwa's question, which is, is it worth taking the risk? There are other there might be other ways uh, to progress. Uh, so one other way, uh, I think you mentioned China. Uh, so let's not underestimate that China may not have a lot of migration in China, but a lot of Chinese go abroad, uh, study abroad, work abroad. Actually, uh, they have uh, policies through which they have to return and work for a minimum number of years in China. So that's another way to do it. Uh, the, the other way is strategic alliances. So this was the case of South Korea, and this is also what China is doing. Uh, so they do joint ventures, and uh, 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 through these joint ventures, they actually manage to create a lot of technology transfer uh, from foreign companies to domestic. Um, but uh, for there is a reason why China is gigantic. It's its quarter of the world. And India, what is it, another 15% of the world? They're about equal. Uh, size. They're about equal. Yeah. <laughs> Population size, they're about equal. Yeah. So, so I think um, a smaller country may need a, a somewhat different strategy when it comes to identification of talent uh, and, uh, and the inflow of people. And uh, it's no uh, wonder why Hong Kong and Singapore cannot take the same um, uh, policies to know-how acquisition as China uh, has. So they had to uh, open up their, their migration policy. Now, whether uh, it's, uh, it's uh, worth taking the risk, I think Nirmala knows much better. Um, I think it's, uh, it's risk only in terms of timing. So the better question to ask, when is the right timing to do this? Okay. Um, by the way, though, the, the, the risk, you know, the risk of a foreigner is an interesting thing because I lived for a period in Indonesia and actually an important tactic of Suharto was to empower, empower Chinese ethnic nationals and large ethnic Chinese conglomerates to take on important economic functions precisely because as Chinese ethnic nationals, they faced no political challenge. So he said, look, I want a really thriving private sector entrepreneurial base that doesn't challenge my political status, that can't possibly arise and be a challenge to my political status. So actually by having the other as part of the dominant economic strategy, he, you balanced, you actually reduced the political risk. So this is partly why I was saying, I can understand that there are certain super hot political ethnicities, right? And risk of terrorism always arises from hot ethnicities. But on the other hand, having the other being part of your economic strategy is often a politically favorable strategy because it disarticulates the political power base from the political power, the economic power base from the political. I mean, Suharto wanted the modern economy largely in Chinese ethnic hands because he knew that that couldn't be a base from which to legitimately oppose him politically. There's something like that going on with my, you know, migration as well, whereas some ethnic, you know, some national identities are going to be super hot politically, but others are like neutral politically, but yet can be really powerful economically, and it all depends on the nitty gritty of identities here. So, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. You want to say something and time is up, so I'm not going to say anything, but you're a vice president of a country. Again, again, you can do whatever I have you the want. <laughs> very, very, quick, very quickly, because of the, of the address of uh, there are countries that are closed and they're doing well, we have been discussing today the issue of what does it mean for the economy to be open or closed. But I don't think that's the issue alone. I think if we live in a global economy and we have development challenges, we do have a responsibility to migrants and people from other countries that are fleeing their country because of unrest, because of war, because of difficult situations. And I do believe that as part of the 
of the global framework, as countries and as citizens of the world, we cannot just think of migration in terms of the economy. We need to think of migration in terms of what this means to human beings that are facing a situation, a reality, and that we should all together think about that and not leave it alone to one country. Thank you very much. Thanks to our panelists.